previously. Pat has worked in strategy and op as an operations consultant, an economic policy advisor, a local government councillor, and has served in a number of not-for-profit boards. Pat lives in Perth um, and is married to Cathy, and they have two lovely children and a very beautiful dog called Eddie um, and an increasingly lazy cat called Cookie. Um, and I've seen from Pat's Facebook page, fo photos also a veggie patch, um, which I'm quite personally quite jealous about. Um, and Janita, um, who also is at TWIS, um, has worked at conservation advocacy and community engagement organisations for a really long time and has um, an extensive amount of campaigning experience dedicated for action on climate change, but also around biodiversity. She's helped secure more uh, protected areas across the state, including the Helena and Aurora Ranges, the Great Western Woodlands, and a suite of Kimberley Marine protected areas. Um, Janita has been recognised as an emerging leader in the fields of environment and sustainability after being awarded the 2019 Emerging Business in Leadership Award. Um, and this native vegetation report, which you're about to hear quite a lot about, is a topic which is the topic of tonight's talk, was developed by Janita, um, particularly in partnership with many people like you on the call tonight. Um, and it took over a year to collate all of this research. Um, when she's not doing all of that, I know Janita has uh, a beautiful two-year-old and a five-year-old um, and a dog, a beautiful dog called Bonnie. Um, actually, I'm reading this wrong. She's a mother of a two-year-old and a five-year-old dog called Bonnie. No, no, I've got this all wrong. I have a two-and-a-half-year-old two year year called, called Bonnie and then I have a, a dog, a rescue dog. dog called Indy and a loving My partner called Lee. Skills has not been so great. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Pat and Janita. Thanks, Maggie. Um, I, I was about to say that was a, a perfect intro, but I'm, I'm glad that you displayed you are human. Um, and um, I'm sure Janita can let us know the ages of her pets and husband and one child. Um, look, thanks um, Thanks again for making the time on a, a fairly wet, wintry and, uh, and online evening. We, we were intending for this obviously to be a face-to-face -face, um, meeting, but, um, but I think sensibly um, a few weeks out, we, we decided it's probably best to be online given we, we weren't quite sure what restrictions might be in place. Um, fortunately for, for us WA folk, we're out of those now. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge um, the, the lands on which most of us um, are, are meeting um, at this point in time, the, the lands of the um, Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. And, and for, for all of us, um, wherever we are patching in from, um, uh, acknowledging the um, the ongoing um, management and connection of First Nations people to their land um, and, uh, and the need for the pursuit of, of environmental and cultural justice um, going forward. Um, Maggie, as, um, as outlined in, in that intro, has done a lot of the, the job for us in terms of contextualising um, some of the, the aspects of this report. Um, but really this evening we wanted um, I guess initially to, to focus in on the recommendations that we've made and, and will be, I guess, used as a, um, a way to respond to the native vegetation policy that the government is in the process of, we believe, um, finalising for, for public comment. Um, so we will certainly be using this report and its recommendations as a a way to um, broaden and, and make that policy sufficiently ambitious to, to manage native vegetation across the state. Um, but we've also taken a um, taken a, almost a, a bioregional view throughout the report as well. And we'd encourage you to utilize the links that you may have access to already, or no doubt will be sent through the course of this evening and, and afterwards from the um, Conservation Council. Um, we, we've recognised the varying challenges that exist bioregion to bioregion um, across such a large state like WA. Um, so we, we have taken, a, a, I guess, a, a view on the various locations that exist around the state, some of those specific uh, challenges that, that may arise, be, be it, you know, us looking at the Kimberley um, in comparison to the Swan Coastal Plain or the Southwest Native Forests. Um, but then equally, we've we've recognised we want to be able to use this for a um, quite a specific purpose in terms of informing and contributing to upcoming um, native vegetation policy discussions with uh, with government. So 
On that basis, we'll, we'll step through each of those recommendations. And uh, as Maggie outlined, there's been some space made available um, probably for around 30 minutes at the end of this evening uh, to, to have a bit of open dialogue and some Q&A. So we'd certainly encourage you to, to send those questions through or, um, or let, uh, let the Cons Council know what uh, you'd like us to respond to um, or if certain things in the, the presentation or those recommendations pique your interest. Um, Janita, I might hand to you, and then when you're ready to go with those recommendations, I'll um, I'll share my screen and we can have a few slides running in the background. Fabulous. Thanks, Pat. And thanks to the Conservation Council for hosting us tonight. Um, we've had collaborative efforts over many years with many of the Cons Council member groups um, to progress this issue on a state-based uh, level. So thank you for all of you that have been putting in the effort over um, the decades to protect our native vegetation you know, in your own patch or in areas that you're really passionate about. Um, so yeah, this report um, that we launched a couple of months ago and that we're focusing on tonight really is um, our efforts to bring forward work that we've seen has been in um, the political wilderness for many years. So we are hoping to, with this report, really um, bring forward some of the key solutions to the vast, the vast array of problems and issues that are facing our native vegetation and our biodiversity across the state, which we have so, so much incredible biodiversity. Um, and we really ha have a lot of op opportunities to protect that biodiversity in different bioregions. But we also think there can be some really excellent policy measures like Pat and also Maggie have reflected um, including um, that, that zero net loss of, of critical habitat and, and looking forward to really gathering more data in order to inform the protection. So uh, Maggie's now put a link in the chat there to our report. Um, if you would like to follow along, we're going to be going through the seven uh, key ways to protect our most valuable natural asset. So um, I'd also like to acknowledge and thank um, the First Nations leaders for contributing to this report in both a biological perspective and also um, for the launch itself that we did a few months ago. Um, I'd like to pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that land that we are all living, working on today was never ceded and was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, so look, I'll go to the first um, the first way that we have really synthesised, we think is a key opportunity to moving forward with protecting our most valuable natural asset. And that is the first um, slide there. So we're going to have a series of slides here for you to take you through the seven reasons. And if you have questions that emerge, like um, Stephanie has put in the chat, please, um, if those questions emerge, please note them down in the chat and we'll be collating um, a series of those so we can get to them at the end of the talk. Um, so the first um, particular, the first point that we'd like to raise is expanding our conservation estate. This is just so key in order to actually genuinely protect um, our most valuable, valuable natural asset, um, including important forest, um, bushland and outback across the state. So we've got um, probably one of the highest species diversities um, globally in any one jurisdiction in WA. There are over 14,000 individual flora species on um, flora base. And we have um, in Australia nationally, we have over a third of the threatened species in Australia are found in WA. So there's actually there's a really good opportunity beyond the plan for our parks campaign to actually secure protected areas in a comprehensive, adequate and representative way. That CAR, the CAR um, approach is one that's nationally um, embedded into our conservation plan, into a conservation plan for protected areas. And we are advocating that we do need a conservation plan for, that, for our state. We need to identify those really key protected areas, areas that we're, like Pat reflected before, we um, and, and Maggie, we're beyond the boundaries of safe limits. And one of those areas especially is um, one that we are all, most of us are going to be living on tonight. And that is in the Perth, the Bulu, the Perth and the Swan Coastal Plain. Um, in 2019, the Tuart Woodlands was added to the critically endangered list. 
and many West Australians have no clue that we are living in one of the most critically endangered ecosystems in, um, in Western Australia and that this, the urban sprawl is adding to that, exacerbating that issue. So we need to really come up with some strategies and uh, together work to ensure that we can protect the best of what we have left and ensure that we can restore um, uh, vast tracts of our southwest um, and do that strategically. So we're hoping to, um, there's also areas like the Kimberley, which you wouldn't think, um, there's actually only 7% of the Kimberley's landmass that is in protected areas like national parks. There's a lot of indigenous protected areas. And the key point that we are calling for here is um, there's, there's protected areas that, um, that are binding and formal, and then there's informal. So the informal reserves like the in indigenous protected areas, they, uh, um, they sound really amazing and they empower um, First Nations groups with the opportunity to do um, healthy country planning and, and empower them to go out and map and monitor those areas. Yet there's no consistent collation of any of that data or or broad protection for any of those areas. There's no veto rights for those traditional owners that hold those indigenous protected areas. They are protected areas by, by name, we would say. Um, and we, you know, there's a really great opportunity to ensure we have more um, vesting, joint vesting um, and management of parks that will protect and that exclude extractive uses and degradating uses. So um, there's really great opportunity for expanding our conservation estate. Uh, the next reason is uh, that we said is actually invest in useful and accurate data. So in terms of um, the monitoring of our native vegetation across the state, that has been done in a very piecemeal way um, over decades. And some areas have been monitored a lot and others um, lack comprehensive monitoring. So um, ultimately uh, from here, there's been, a, there's been a range of programs that have put in, been put into place by various departments over the years. And um, they are, um, depending on who's leading in an area, for example, the rangelands, a lot of the data on the rangelands, um, uh, the, the, range, the Auditor General's report from that particular issue, um, that was, it was really um, eye-opening to see that some of the data is actually kept on a laptop in someone's, um, uh, on an Excel spreadsheet. There's no transparent access to data about what, exi what exists native vegetation-wise, so what condition the native vegetation is in and what even exists before what condition it's in. So we have no single data set for the whole state. Um, so that's a really key point. In terms of other useful and accurate data, uh, in 2007 was the last State of the Environment report that was done. Um, and in 2006, um, there was a plan that was released by then the, the then Environment Minister, Mark McGowan, uh, which was uh, called a 100-year biodiversity strategy for uh, Western Australia, a blue, blueprint for the blueprint a blueprint for the bicentennial. That was the title of this incredible document, which seems to be lost in the political wilderness as a month after that was almost finalised, they lost the election to two successive um, Liberal governments. So with, there's a really awesome opportunity as well to really take now that the Labor government has won the election and, you know, we are in a really go good spot to empower WA Labor to take another good look at that report that they put so much effort into and try and have a rethink about how we can um, progress that biodiversity strategy for the whole state, because that's also what's needed. And that's what's lacking from the current Biodiversity um, and Conservation Act that we have in Western Australia. Um, there is no comprehensive planning for that. Um, so look, in terms of um, biodiversity um, monitoring, um, experts that I researched for this report actually shared with me that they think there's probably less than 40% of WA has been systematically um, um, actually monitored for biodiversity. So there's a really good opportunity for the government to invest in this monitoring. And we've actually called for a $10 million monitoring program annually. And that would be comprehensively rolled out across the state. Um, 
Um, and that would that would really gather that information from where we could make good decisions and inform decisions. To date, a lot of the information that's collected on biodiversity, it's collected by industry for projects that they would like to carry out. And that to date has been keeping kept in sort of um, various um, under wraps, really. So there is a project by the government right now you may have heard of called the Biodiversity Information Office. And the, DBC, the Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions are bringing that office together. And that is, that is aiming to get to open up that transparency of data and allow people to access that data collectively. Now, we think that's a, that is a good step, but what we see is missing is the information about areas that haven't been monitored for maybe many years, even decades, and especially if they're earmarked for development. If we don't have that basic information before uh, to make informed decisions from, we're really flying blind and we can't make good decisions about cumulative impacts, which is um, a really key issue as well. Um, so look, that's, um, that's a summary around in investing useful and accurate data. Um, we expanded it out from just a native vegetation monitoring program. We really thought um, the best um, use of and spend of our, our money and time would be a biodiversity monitoring program. So really comprehensively rolling that out. And there's a lot of skills that exist within um, our bureaucracy in WA to be able to do that. And I think that there will be really good options for consultation on that in the future with groups um, like that are on the call tonight. So I would strongly advocate you get involved. Um, the next goal is a securing a net gain of native vegetation. So the upcoming policy, um, that was actually inspired by us taking a look at some data that was released by the National Greenhouse Gas Accounting Data back in 2017. Um, they released this national data that said WA was the third highest primary deforester in the country. And we looked at that data and said, wow, we have no such data in WA. And we took that to um, a whole range of bureaucrats and decision makers, and they awkwardly shuffled papers and agreed that we don't have the data in WA. So that actually kicked off this whole process of, of rethinking what's happening with our native bio, with our native vegetation. What do we need to do? And there was an issues paper put out <clears throat> about a year ago that many of you, I'm sure, fed into. And now we're coming to the point where we'll be able to advocate for that. Um, we heard from the minister recently that it will be imminent, this policy will be coming out for public consultation. So <clears throat> it's a really good opportunity for lots of different groups to have their say in this space and can raise the issues you're working on. We have been working with um, groups across the state, such as Environs, Kimberley, in, in the north, right down to the West Australian Forest Alliance. And we think there's an excellent opportunity to secure a net gain of biodiversity and a no net loss of critical habitat, ultimately, is what Maggie was reflecting at the beginning of the chat. And that is really understanding. To, in order to do that, we need to understand what we have and make sure that we are keeping that really high conservation value, biodiversity, forests, bushland, outback. And we're not actually, um, we're, we're not clearing that out of sight and out of mind um, while securing um, uh, a lot of, um, uh, securing other biodiversity and vegetation through replanting, for example. Replanting is an excellent way of sequestering carbon, but the best way is to look after and protect those very um, carbon rich, dense, um, biodiversity hotspots that we have left. So the net gain goal is a really sort of key one and we'll be advocating that that is adopted in the upcoming policy reform. Terrific, thanks Janita. Um, so we'll, we're about halfway, four out of seven. So, um, so we'll get to the, that Q&A um, relatively soon. The fourth recommendation um, we've structured within the report is um, the, the rethinking and reassessment of, of fire management across the, the state, um, particularly with a, um, a concerted effort to review the rapid response um, 
capabilities uh, across the, the state government um, and also rethinking that prescribed burning um, methodology, which has been, I guess, increasingly topical um, in, in the last little while. It, it felt like for a time, a number of the, the issues that we were looking at that related to each of these recommendations through the course of last year, um, for, for obvious reasons, we're in a, a bit of stasis. Um, but there really has been, um, you know, a confluence of um, events, adverse events environmentally that have, um, have you know, moved, um, moved the needle in terms of public awareness in relation to a lot of these uh, recommendations, no more so than um, bushfires and, and certainly that prescribed burning methodology. Um, the target, uh, it would be no surprise to, to any of you for, for the Wilderness Society that that seems to be a completely out of date approach. It's something that's very blunt, uh, crude. The, the 200,000 hectares that is targeted um, within the, the southwest of the state um, really does seem to be increasingly out of time. Um, and many of you on the call that I can see tonight, um, you would have attended um, a really excellent uh, fire and biodiversity. Um, forum that was in Margaret River, it was probably only a couple of weeks ago, but it feels like a long time ago. Um, I, I think the very fact that there were close to 300, if not more so, um, folks that have made their way down to Margaret River um, Friday before the long weekend, as I can recall it, early June, um, uh, you know, the, the fact that there was that level of interest and certainly within the room, a level of engagement and energy and passion for, for obtaining some more uh, more sustainable thinking and, and solutions um, out of out of the department and out of the government I think you know speaks to the fact that this this issue isn't going to go away um, what we want to see is a, a renewed um, level of energy across the government to consider alternate approaches um, at, and I think Professor Kingsley Dixon at that forum um, outlined a, a number of these that, that could be a, a suitable replacement for, for the prescribed burning um, mechanism, uh, particularly those around the, the more sophisticated monitoring uh, across the state that can be undertaken, um, particularly with, with you know, satellite detection um, technology and the like. Um, a more rapid response, um, and early detection, I should say, and then a, a more rapid response uh, that can be mobilised um, to the, the you know, priority areas across the, the state. Um, now, I know there's, there's sort of moves afoot um, across a number of groups, some of which are represented on the call, um, to increase the, the level of lobbying and um, uh, advocacy towards government. Um, we'll, we'll certainly um, look to encourage as, as much of that as, as possible. Um, particularly as the native vegetation policy comes out for, for further consideration when that draft policy hopefully is released, um, hopefully in weeks rather than uh, rather than months. We, we've been holding our breath for some time, um, but it shouldn't be too far away. Fifth of the um, seven recommendations um, is one that, again, um, seems to be um, emerging continually, progressing continually every time we, we look at it. Um, and that is the expansion of land restoration and associated practices across the, the state. Um, principally, I, I guess the, the hook within the report to, to grab the attention is you know, a significant increase in that funding commitment that would be initially provided by government to the tune of 100 million. Um, which brings it some way towards the, the levels that some other jurisdictions across Australia are, are looking to pursue. Um, in keeping with the, the sort of zeitgeist of um, the last couple of weeks in Australian politics, uh, while it's not a race, um, it absolutely is a race. Uh, and the jurisdictions, I think, that can generate a level of maturity uh, in terms of their ability to manage um, and guide land restoration efforts are going to be um, very well placed for something that's not just going to have um, significant benefits across the, the state from an environmental perspective, but certainly in terms of encouraging investment into, um, into Australia, into a sustainable industry. Um, this is a space that can absolutely tick that box. But we want that done in the right manner. So we've set out a number of principles, both within this report, 
Um, and in terms of our ongoing dialogue with, with the relevant government agencies, ministers, ministerial staff, um, we've outlined a couple of key principles that we want to see attached to any of those um, funding commitments that might be placed into this space. And, and we know there's there's been a recent uh, announcement of $15 million of, of funding towards um, land restoration uh, practices, a, a land restoration program. Um, we're encouraging of that. We, we obviously want um, a greater degree of ambition. Um, first of, of those principles, of course, is, is the the skin in the game, if you like, uh, and that significant funding commitment from government. We also want the expert input and, and advice um, providing providing input into uh, the initial stages around the, the design of that program, um, remove it from ideology, remove it from um, perhaps pre-existing modes of, of thinking within government bureaucracies and really take account of what is a, um, a rapidly moving space um, across Australia. Other jurisdictions are encountering the same sorts of challenges and considerations alongside WA as it steps into this um, new and, and really exciting um, uh, style of program delivery for government. We want to see the incentivization of carbon and biodiversity benefits um, as, as being something that is prioritised in terms of where that funding is applied. Um, you know, both on a, a bioregional um, level, but also um, effectively we want to avoid the, um, you know, the money for blue glum plantations or, or the monoculture um, uh, monoculture outcomes that have, have quite often been generated through other emission reduction schemes and, and the like that we've, we've seen across Australia. Um, the investment decision should obviously be guided by the relative weighting of various co-benefits, um, be they regional employment, First Nations engagement, uh, those levels of additional carbon and biodiversity benefits. Um, there, there obviously needs to be a very transparent way of incentivising that investment um, and ensuring that we're, we're prioritising the right projects in the right locations across the state. And then finally, um, there's a, um, a unique opportunity to um, integrate traditional ecological knowledge into the, the, the centre of, of a, what should be a significant government program. Um, the ability to take stock, as, as we talked about in that initial acknowledgement of country, the ability to take stock and um, uh, bring in an understanding of, of the land, the, the ongoing connection and management of that land um, into the consideration of, of the way land restoration is undertaken across the state is, um, is something that is uh, absolutely appropriate, um, long overdue, and, and we think is um, a you know, very noble aim that, uh, that government should be, um, should be taking, um, taking head on. The second last of our recommendations, just let me bring those slides up. There we go. It's going to jump one ahead. Uh, so the six out of the, the seven recommendations that we're making in the report is the embedding of community rights within our, um, uh, certainly our West Australian legislation um, and ensuring in effect that universal community rights are baked into um, environmental law and any associated intersectional aspects of, um, of the, the projects and campaigns that we're, we're all respectively working on and, and likewise for our various members and supporters um, across the community. First and foremost, uh, be it fracking proposals, be it um, land clearing, anything of a significant um, environmental impact, uh, we would uh, certainly be advocating for free, prior and informed consent as something that needs to be prioritised by government. Um, and, and that will continue to be um, a topic of interest, I would imagine, and out of um, public consideration as the government steps through a number of consultations, not just native vegetation, but also the, um, you know, the long awaited Aboriginal Cultural Heritage Bill um, that, that should appear or reappear at some stage later this year. Um, we also recognise that there's a leap of faith that government need to play here in terms of moving from what really is information 
um, that's distributed under the guise of consultation towards genuine consultation um, and an understanding there that that's hard. It takes time. It takes significant effort and investment. Um, it takes a level of trust in that process um, and those that are participating in the process that um, they might need to walk back um, certain policies or, or certain decisions that have been made in the past for the benefit of the community based on what the community um, is, is saying through those consultation processes. And, and I think we've all been involved or probably are involved in, in multiple areas at the moment in processes that uh, are really insufficient as a genuine consultative effort. Um, but again, as a starting point for, for native vegetation in this instance, uh, we'll be making you know, a strong recommendation to that policy that there needs to be far greater levels of, of transparent, um, well-advanced uh, and, and genuinely mature community consultation in this, in this space. The last point I just want to make on the, the community rights aspect to this um, is ensuring that we can enshrine those third party rights that other jurisdictions across Australia have managed to um, manage to grapple with and, and they haven't fallen into a hole. Um, we, we want to see those um, having a, a place and, and being central to any environmental law reform going forward. Um, again, to improve the level of, of public trust in the process, uh, to promote that level of public accountability uh, that the government should be looking to encourage uh, and to increasingly make transparent uh, the decisions of, of government and the efforts that are made to genuinely monitor uh, and potentially enforce um, things like land clearing principles and, and decisions that are made with various conditions. Um, as Janita outlined in um, a, a couple of slides previous, the, the lack of um, uh, investment the government has made in that space around monitoring and enforcement uh, really leaves open you know, a, huge, a huge loophole for, uh, for bad actors um, across the state to, to undertake clearing that is of an illegal nature or well outside the bounds of, um, of what has been agreed by, by previous government decisions. The last uh, recommendation is uh, around, so seven of seven, is the adoption of enhanced national standards. So um, boosting that level of government accountability and uh, compliance and enforcement, as, as I outlined before. Um, this is off the back of uh, the significant amount of work that the Wilderness Society and many other groups have been doing uh, in regard to the independent review of the EPBC. Um, just a reminder, uh, you know, that hasn't been um, something that's been designed by the environmental movement. Uh, it's a, a clear um, uh, fail mark that's been provided um, by Professor Graham Samuel, someone who is very adept and expert, um, I guess, in the, the top end of town in terms of government regulation and, and government program delivery. Uh, he's, he's certainly not in and of the movement itself, but he has delivered um, quite a damning report really uh, in relation to the Commonwealth Government's ability to, uh, to oversee um, the, the EPBC Act, but then the, the principles that are um, uh, legislated on within that Act uh, are not really up to the task of addressing uh, contemporary environmental uh, risks. Um, and, and known public policy failures um, that are occurring in every jurisdiction across Australia and, and certainly those with, um, with federal government responsibility. Our point here, and, and this is one that has constantly been moving around as we've, we've designed this report, is that there's, a, um, there's an emerging um, and what would seem to be you know, significant momentum behind this, this push around devolving uh, environmental powers to state governments. Um, there's a, a policy and a legislative um, aspect to that, which um, we will continue to follow and advocate on uh, in regard to, to ensuring that, you know, we're not, um, we're not going to be trading off uh, environmental responsibilities of the state for the, for the sake of one or two miners who, uh, who benefit from that process. But there's also a, um, I guess, a, a risk for government here, and it's something that we've been attempting to highlight um, when we've been discussing this type of 
um, uh, this type of aspect with um, with ministers and, and ministerial staff, certainly the departments as well. State governments will find themselves in a position where they won't be able to shirk responsibility for those national matters of environmental significance. So previously, there was a bit of a, um, a finger pointing exercise if if things went wrong and um, should that power be devolved to state governments to, to solely um, administer the, the EPBC Act, it'll be very difficult for, for those state environment ministers, for um, any of the state government departments and the state governments as a whole, uh, you know, to, to walk back um, adverse environmental impacts. Uh, so we want to see um, an objective, um, unemotional, um, uh, response around the way that Western Australia would still be able to meet um, the contemporary uh, threats to matters of national environmental significance through the process of any, any devolution. And that needs to happen not uh, as the consultation with Senate crossbenchers is occurring, that may, needs to happen well in advance of, of any of those discussions and considerations, again, so that that is uh, perfectly transparent uh, and open to uh, to public comment and, and input. What I might do now is, Janita, I might hand back to you just to quickly talk through um, the process that was undertaken and, and particularly the report launch, which um, had to, to ride through a number of, of different COVID-related challenges, but I'll, um, I'll jump off mute and, and jump to that slide. Yeah, thanks, Pat. Um, so, yeah, look, ultimately we um, launched the report um, just after the election as we didn't see, um, yeah, it was, we really see this as a long-term long opportunity for change. And there we've got um, Uncle Ben Taylor um, and others really, um, and Dr Stephen Van Leeuwen at the launch as well, um, and Auntie Mingley and Daniel also uh, really um, standing there as a supporting the project, but also really telling their own stories. Um, they, they told at this launch of really what um, native vegetation means to them and their, their cultural um, heritage and connection to it over years and what the, the loss in the Southwest, um, especially of our state, um, 18 million hectares clear, what that has, what that really meant to them. So that was really amazing to hear that from them directly at the, at the launch. And we really like to acknowledge um, uh, and thank them for coming along to help us launch that report. It was pretty incredible to see that I think we only um, invited around 30 folks to the launch, thinking it was in a COVID lockdown area and we had around 60 turn up. So uh, lots of interest from a range of different um, departments, um, um, different folks that have been working on this strategy and the policy launch, um, different organisations like WOBSI, WOMSI, the, Wilderness, uh, the Wildflower Society, uh, West Australian Forest Alliance, um, uh, Gondwana Link. There was a lot of different representatives from, from uh, different um, BirdLife Australia, different groups that came along. So we'd really like to thank all of you for both feeding into the report, but also helping us launch it in a successful way in a very difficult time. And um, I wouldn't, I'd be amiss if I um, didn't mention Rex there, our Borden's Cockatoo, who um, was our uh, key token three threatened species that came along, but really, you know, helped give a, a face to what we were talking about. Um, there were, the BirdLife report recently reflected that for Carnaby's cockatoos, if we don't make change and protect and produce more habitat, plant more habitat for those birds um, to feed on in feeding areas, they could start dying of starvation within three years. So that's some pretty shocking stuff. So I think that, um, you know, we'd really like to acknowledge the input of a lot of different scientists as well. Um, Dr. Hugh Finn's on the call, I'd like to put a shout out to yourself and, and also others that, that have been researching in this field for decades. Um, uh, we had, yeah, really, really like to acknowledge um, all of that, um, that support and, um, and really a, a lot of the, the, um, the help to launch that report, it really came from the community. So we'd really like to acknowledge and thank you for that. Thanks, Janita, and apologies for flicking through the, the slides. Um, 
that wasn't meant to bring you to a close, but I'll um, round out. I'll round out with this one, and then uh, then we can jump to the Q and A. And, and I haven't been following the chat, but I'm sure a few um, questions have been uh, coming through as we've been speaking to this. So there's a couple of, of obvious next steps um, that that both form um, actions for the Wilderness Society directly in relation to this report. Uh, but also um, hopefully prompt each of each of you and, and again, the respective members and supporters that you're representing tonight uh, in terms of, uh, you know, next, next steps that um, could be applicable um, in relation to each of these actions. The first of those, um, and probably most obvious, certainly the most pressing, um, is the, the new quite novel and exciting uh, community survey that's been put out by the Minister for Environment Amber Jade Sanderson um, on the Southwest Native Forests, um, attempting to gather, um, I guess, a contemporary understanding of the, the community views around the values and preferred future use for those forests. Um, obviously, there's a, a need to um, permanently protect those high conservation values that are, are present throughout um, the southwest, um, the southwest forest. We'd be encouraging each of you, um, and, and I know links will come around in relation to that that survey. If you haven't come across it, be very surprised if you haven't, uh, because it's certainly been doing the rounds of just about every social media platform and an email distribution list of late. For what it's worth, the Wilderness Society will be communicating with our um, our members uh, as well in WA uh, in relation to a, a prompt. Um, given that that's got about a I think a fortnight to run, it closes on the 1st of August. So if you haven't or your organisation hasn't provided um, input into that community survey um, on the, the Native Forests, uh, please do so. Um, and I know um, a number of, of you in the audience this evening are from the WA Forest Alliance. Um, they've got a, a great survey guide that um, allows for, for pretty easy interpretation of, of that um, survey design. Um, as I said, we'll, uh, we'll also um, be communicating to the Wilderness Society supporters on that basis. Second um, point that I just wanted to raise here, obviously the, the native vegetation policy has been um, cooking for a long time. Um, it, it entered a, a little bit of a period of stasis last year. Um, due to COVID and an apparent inability to, to consult with the, the community, um, but it is, you know, well, well overdue now and we are um, still patiently uh, but very eagerly awaiting uh, the emergence of a, a draft policy that will be out for public comment. We think in the order of, say, a six to eight week period. Off the back of this report, obviously, we've got um, seven recommendations, but a whole um, series of, of literature and references that we we want to provide to government and, and provide input into that draft policy to ensure it is as ambitious and um, suitable for um, the, the really desperate needs of, of native vegetation across the state. Uh, last but not least, it'd be very remiss of me not to mention this um, any time I was in front of you all, um, our community organising program, Movement for Life, um, which is the national organising program that has um, a number of groups within WA involved, There's a few of our members uh, within Movement for Life that are on the, the call tonight, um, they do fabulous work to generate uh, community-led action, local action on um, environmental issues that are, are close to the hearts of those individuals and, and groups and communities um, uh, that they're, they're made up from. So if you do have any um, interest to engage with a, a you know, set of like-minded individuals within your hometown, uh, get in touch via the, the links that will be distributed um, and we can certainly point you in the right direction and help you join the conversation. Um, on that note, I'm going to stop sharing um, and bring everyone back into the room. Um, I might hand back to Maggie. I know you've been collating and curating various questions that may have been coming through over the course of the last uh, 50 minutes or so. I have. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Pat and Janita, for that really comprehensive presentation. It's the second time I've seen it because I was lucky enough to be one of those uh, 60 people. I'm not actually sure if I was invited. I might have been one of those uh, sneaky additions that tagged along for the ride. Um, but it was really fabulous to hear it then. And it's really wonderful to hear it again now. 
Um, just a reminder, due to the Zoom logistics, we're not able to unmute people. So if you do have a question, please pop it in um, the chat box so that we can make sure that we get to it. Um, so first up, um, and it, uh, Pat and Janita, I'll send you the chat later because there are some interesting comments and things which I won't cover, but just interesting for you to read when you have time. Um, first question is around the coastal um, situation and particularly kelp and seagrass meadows and how they're also a part, uh, important part of um, native vegetation and biodiversity. Is that part of um, the monitoring and other bits of work that you're looking at in this report? Thanks for that question, Maggie. Um, we didn't focus on marine vegetation in terms of native vegetation in this report. Uh, we mainly focused on bioregions and land um, vegetation, native vegetation. Um, we're really mindful that it does comprise and it really does, there's, there's significant seagrass loss has occurred um, across Shark Bay over the last decade and that's an ongoing issue. We do think that that should be included in the biodiversity monitoring program. However, we've really mainly focused this report on land instead of um, the marine biodiversity and the incredible biodiversity of, of seagrass and algae in our southwest particularly. We acknowledge that, yet this report was mainly focused on land component of native veg. Fabulous, thank you. Uh, I think this one might be for you, Pat, um, and it's related to Alcoa. Um, Obviously, Alcoa have a plan to clear a bunch of Jarrah forest down in the in Darling Range, um, which is prime habitat for a lot of different species, but particularly black cockatoos. Um, what can people do to get involved in stopping this ongoing destruction? Yes, uh, lots, but um, I guess from the outset, and I think a similar question came up, uh, when we were talking about the, the election um, commitments and, and the lay of the land there. Alcoa has been um, allowed access through a variety of state agreements to um, mine bauxite that sits beneath very um, high conservation value Jarrah forest. You know, using agreements that were in effect written when we were sending men to the moon. Um, and I know a number of you have heard me use that analogy before, but I think it's it's useful to sort of highlight again how how out of touch um, the reality of of those operations are, and how counter to any consideration of, of sustainability or, or forest management that may be. Um, first and foremost, I would encourage you to add comments of of that nature. Um, concerning the, the impacts from bauxite mining, Alcoa's expansion on the northern Jarrah forests, um, include that within the, the community survey on, um, on forests. Um, we as an organisation will continue to engage with government in relation to that proposed um, expansion. There's, there's been a referral that's been made by Alcoa um, to access an additional um, 7,000 hectares or thereabouts of, of northern Jarrah Forest. Um, it is a really significant um, operation that I don't think has, I guess, a level of public visibility or awareness in the same way that iron ore mining or gold mining um, has. I, I think there's this connotation that it doesn't exist that close to Perth and with the with the impact that it does, you know, even visually from satellite imagery, the, the cauliflower scar that exists um, around that Huntley mine um, is, is quite staggering. And that's that's the bird's eye view or the satellite's eye view. Um, when you're on the ground and next to those mining pods, um, it is just breathtaking for all the wrong reasons uh, that that has been, has been allowed to happen. Um, and look, I could only encourage you just to, to remain in touch with, with organisations like ours, um, because we will certainly be um, engaging very, uh, very considerably um, in, in relation to the public environmental review that the EPA will conduct. But we're also um, certainly advocating for additional levels of independent assessment. So the Environmental Protection Act, as many of you know, has provision for strategic advice or strategic assessments um, directed by the, the minister, conducted by the EPA. Um, we, we believe, you know, 
moving away from that project to project churn is going to be a really important um, step in in that process of, of assessing the, the impacts on the northern Jarrah forests and the appropriate way to be um, preserving those, those biodiversity and high conservation values um, that the, the bauxite sits underneath. Fabulous. And I'll just uh, thank Jess, the Director and Convener of the WA Forest Alliance for popping in the chat here. But um, for those that are interested, WAFA are running a tour um, on the 24th and 25th of July at the Northern Jarra Forests. And um, I believe, Jess will correct me if I'm wrong, but that's open to um, anyone who would like to do that. And you can find more information um, on the WAFA website. Um, a question around, um, from Susan, around um, the native vegetation clearing that's going to need to occur for renewable energy projects um, and how we as a sector might deal with some of those concerns um, and how that fits in more broadly with some of the points that you mentioned um, and particularly um, around data and things like that. Yeah, thanks, Maggie. Um, I might jump in and then you can join in later, Pat. Um, so I suppose that, yeah, we advocate for that there, we, we are supportive of renewable energy, but some of the projects you've recently, you mentioned, I just looked today, there's two large, huge projects, mega projects in WA that are proposed right now. And one is um, 1.5 million hectares and the other is 650,000 hectares of native vegetation that is proposed to be um, in those two projects. So that is huge. We um, have a policy position uh, within the Wilderness Society that we advocate for no, net, uh, no new projects to be cleared, new land to be cleared. You know, any of these projects should be finding existing cleared land to produce and to, to create these projects on. I know that's not always practical, but that is our policy. We would, we would advocate for that quite strongly. Um, Pat, did you have anything to add? Oh, look, I think um, you know, there's there's been a, I guess, a newsworthy element of um, those those projects, just given the massive scale, both both within the Pilbara with the Asian Renewable Energy Hub, and and then the more recent. I think as recent as, as 24 hours ago, the proposal on the southwest coast of WA. Obviously, in reality, I think both of those are relatively early in their sort of conceptual phase. And um, we, we as an organisation acknowledge there will need to be displacement of, of our existing dependence on fossil fuels with, with renewable sources of energy, um, but that's not at all costs. Um, and, and as Janita outlined, there's, there's an important consideration around the way um, governments can actually guide the appropriate investment, both in terms of the nature of that investment, but also where that is directed within the state to ensure that the impacts, particularly on native vegetation, um, you know, don't continue to, um, to sort of push that, that issue further down. Um, it, it'd be a, a huge shame if, you know, the, the victim out of um, an increased um, availability of renewable energy was was those biodiversity values and, and the carbon values and the like that exist within our stocks of native vegetation across the state. Mm, and our threatened species and their critical habitat. <laughs> Definitely, thank you for that. Um, two related questions from David and Steph, so I'm gonna lump them together. Um, how is your consultation going with the state government on this at the moment um, and how are you thinking about going convincing them more broadly that we need to adopt these recommendations great question yes. advocacy 101 you want to jump in pat no no far away well we have already met with the environment minister on this report um, she welcomed it and has um, uh, shared in that meeting that she thought that the upcoming um, policy rethink uh, could do with some ambition inserted in there. So that I think that's a bit of a throwdown to everyone to ensure that uh, she thinks that there's opportunity to make the draft policy better. Um, so that's a really great uh, opportunity for us to all feed in and, and get some more ambitious targets. She's also reflected in terms of the um, biodiversity monitoring that 
um, that there are options for in the next budget coming up for there to be change. So we are starting to yeah, meet with different decision makers, ministers, and we also would advocate that all, all of the groups that are here tonight, if you're representing a group or you're an individual, you know, go and speak to your local MP, um, have a look at some of the regions you're passionate about or if you've got a certain case and really um, advocate for um, some of these key changes collectively because if we can have collective action, it's going to be much more powerful than individual actions. Um, all And we're, we're singing from the same song sheet, that's going to be better. Um, I think uh, one of the other key things I'll just reflect there is that there are some really huge disparities of decision making in this space. So when Pat talked about those community rights, um, there's a lot of opportunities for change in on local government, state government and federal level in terms of actually being heard, having the right data and then, um, you know, really access to, to justice and being able to test those decisions. So we are nationally rolling out a community rights uh, campaign in regards to that, to try and really raise awareness of some of these issues on a national scale and get that change in, in and have that, that larger normative change than just um, issue by issue basis as well. Great. Pat? Um, no, Pat, do you have anything to add? No, no, if, if you've got a, a list of questions to get through, Maggie, I'd prefer to address well, them. It's not a list, but I always um, like hearing the answers to the questions as well. Um, but this one's around, could one of you uh, talk about a bit more about what net gain means? Are we talking about zero clearing or are we talking about clearing that is required to then be offset? Um, I, th this question sort of makes the comment that um, if offsetting is enabled, allowed to be used to then clear habitat, then that could be quite potentially very problematic. Yeah, there's there's certainly not the intention, um, and and within the report we we make a number of comments around the you know the offsetting regimes that are used as a bit of a, a way to wash blood off hands um, in regard to the the original clearing that's um, that's undertaken. The concept around that net gain, I guess, takes into account not just the um, the extent of, of native vegetation that exists across the state, but also the, the condition that it's in. And, and hopefully um, with, with this advocacy push, with this renewed draft policy that, that should be coming out relatively soon and, and whatever form that takes as a final policy, um, we are remaining optimistic that there can be a, a level of um, restoration, um, regeneration, revegetation that's that's renewed from that. That's that's really the outcome that we um, we want to see driven there. While we ensure that no um, no new clearing is is approved on um, you know those those areas like the Swan Coastal Plain where you you have such a critical loss of of habitat over um, decades and and you know, really since since European settlement. Um, Janita, did you want to add anything more um, around the, the net gain concept? Yeah, look, um, I think offsets is a really interest, yeah, a really good point to make here that we don't think that is a solution by any means. We actually think a lot of the biodiversity offsets that are given, there is no like for like that can be found. They don't exist. So a lot of these, if they were tested, in courts, if that was a, if we had a merits-based uh, approval system and, and, and testing system, they would be rejected. So offsets I've heard from a few different um, um, contacts in and outside of the government in um, that they don't think offsets are gonna be part of the future makeup, um, but that is, yeah, maybe that is um, optimism. It's a really interesting um, conversation to have around offsets and what net, net zero means. And I think we could all spend a lot of time sort of talking about that um, because it is really very interesting. Um, a question around government uh, undertaking strategic assessments and whether we as a movement should be asking government to undertake one for the existing loss and potential future loss of vegetation that arise specifically for developments proposed in areas that are outside the southwest and the wheat belt. Um, but I guess you know this question also goes to the, the the kind of the concept of strategic assessments more broadly. Yeah. So 
Um, as I highlighted with the, the proposed expansion Alcoa has put to the EPA um, and the WA public by, by default, um, we in certain instances are, are very keen for the, for the government to be using um, or directing its agencies uh, to utilise those, those aspects of the, the Environmental Protection Act that are, are there for a reason. Um, we had a recent meeting with the, the new chair, or relatively new chair of the, the EPA, Professor Matthew Tonts, um, and, and raised the fact that for, for a range of issues across the state, you would think there's a, a warranted need, um, you know, short of state of the environment reporting, um, a, a whole tranche of strategic assessments and, and pieces of strategic advice um, that move the EPA away from just dealing with that project to project churn um, and the endless list of referrals that, that they respond to. And also, I think it, you know, the nature of a, a focus on, on those project referrals means that organisations like ours, like like all of ours, um, we end up being being sort of drawn into that churn as well. And it's um, it's not necessarily the most productive um, space space to be in. Um, if there is the ability for government to undertake those strategic assessments for the Northern Jarra Forest, for um, you know the state of the Great Western Woodlands, I, th th there's a, a range of applications for those sections of the Act. Um, we'd certainly be encouraging them to uh, to be utilising those those powers. I think that comes back to, in part, those considerations about the way these activities are funded within government. There needs to be a greater level of um, uh, impetus on on funding those those actions. That that level of genuine consultation with uh, with the community, and certainly through the native vegetation policy and any consultation that the government commits to will be uh, will be making those recommendations very clear um, and prioritised. Right, Janita, did you have anything to add on that? Um, I'll look, no, I think Pat covered it. <laughs> uh, great. Um, the next question, we, we actually get quite a lot, um, and it's around how do you get the government when they've signed up to be signatories for things like the International Panel for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services or the long list of other things that we've, um, as a country, signed up to? How do we make governments accountable for signing these agreements? Um, and I guess from a state perspective, um, you know, what is that kind of interaction look like between federal government signing up to something and state governments making decisions um, about projects and other things? It's an excellent point and an excellent question. Um, a bunch of our report speaks to the international conventions we are signed up to, which we then, you know, nationally are meant to administer. And now with the de-evolution proposal of our federal environment laws to the states, that is really placing, you know, one elected representative, the Environment Minister of WA, for example, in control of matters of international or global environmental significance. So I think these things need to be raised and there's a uh, awareness needs to be raised about them. So, um, you know, tools through the media and through reports like this can really raise awareness that this is not we live in an incredible biodiversity hotspot in the southwest of WA but we also live in an incredibly biodiverse state and these the species are found nowhere else on earth and ecological systems that are still intact um, and cultural landscapes that are still intact that aren't anywhere else are here and we need to really really communicate to our decision makers that they are making decisions of global importance when they make these yeah and there's a you know there's an economic um rationalization that needs to be made with australia remaining a laggard in in relation to you know a number of these conventions and and international agreements they're Again, it might be wildly optimistic, but there, there does seem to be a renewed focus on, I guess, that widening gap between where Australia is and perhaps where the consensus of the, the international community, you know, even, even subcomponents of that, the, the EU block, um, are when it comes to um, carbon and, and biodiversity. 
um, things like carbon border adjustment mechanisms um, were you know, a long way off um, even a couple of years ago. All of a sudden that seems to be um, somewhat of an inevitable um, stop on the road. Um, and as, as a result, <laughs> there actually is a economic and or financial implication in terms of um, what that means to, to our state that needs to, and, and our country, that needs to operate in a, um, a regional and a, a global world. Um, look, if you've got the, um, I'm not sure who exactly asked that question, but if you do have the secret source around um, how do we ensure the government commits to what previous governments have said future Australian governments will do? It might be of different political persuasions, let me know. But um, look, I'm, I'm being cynical there, um, but I, I would like to sort of remind everyone that there, there does seem to be that emerging global consensus that, that puts Australia as a, a firm outlier and firm laggard in relation to a lot of those conventions. Yeah. Absolutely, Pat. And I just follow up with saying that even though um, uh, it's shocking, climate impact and climate risk is being taken seriously by some companies, biodiversity risk isn't. It's an emerging field. So I think there's actually a really good opportunity for us to raise biodiversity and climate risk as one when we are doing so in corporate boardrooms as well as to our governments. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is around the long amount of time it took for the West Australian Conservation Movement to get the Biodiversity and Conservation Act um, and what you see as the benefit of advocating for a Native Vegetation Act or this a new act rather than seeking amendments to the existing um, biodiversity and conservation piece of legislation. Great question. And there's always these uh, interesting uh, interesting windows of opportunity that emerge. Uh, 25 years ago, that movement started. And by the time it was delivered, it, um, yeah, there's a, there's a few things we still want to have in there that weren't in there. <laughs> Let's face it, there's a God clause in there that allows for the minister to make a decision to allow species to go extinct. I don't think anyone on the call would advocate for that to be kept in if we were to rewrite that. Um, so the good, the good news is there is an opportunity. It's meant to be every five years. So 2000, this year is five years since the BC Act um, was actually um, uh, ratified. So there is a, a public comment period coming up for that. So there's a good opportunity there to make change. But I suppose how we see there, there could be a different opportunity here as well. We don't see this policy reform and policy consultation period by government as the only mechanism. We're actually pushing for a whole of government reform to this and there could be opportunities down the line. We've sought advice on opportunities for the Nat for a Native Vegetation Act and uh, also a, um, a Restoration Act to come into play together. So, <laughs> I mean, the, the, key, the key point to make on this one here is that we have no clue what's being illegally cleared. If I didn't already, already mention that, <laughs> that is a really key point of this report. We have no data. We have never known how much of our native vegetation has been cleared illegally. We do not have that information. If we had it, then it would actually inform um, a much better uh, pathway forward to restoration, as well as um, really taking account of what we've got. So there's a really key opportunity to do that accounting mechanism before we put millions, you know, we've, there's been 15 million uh, put forward for restoration and land restoration um, with co-benefits. You know, we're advocating for that to go to 100 million, but before that piece comes to play, we need to take stock of what we are losing illegally as well as legally that shouldn't be right as well. <laughs> Uh, and then we can actually come forward with a piece that might be, and that, that Native um, Vegetation Act is, a, uh, is definitely um, a piece of uh, advocacy from um, John Bailey, our um, emeritus professor and honourable board member of TWIS. Um, he's really passionate about that. And I think it, is a, it could be a good opportunity, but we need to build, um, build that support for that change. And I think it's in that piece that I just spoke to. We need to, the accountability piece needs to be looked at. And that's a really key part of this reform. Yeah, and in that consideration of new acts, amendments to existing acts, 
I'm, I'm somewhat agnostic um, and Janita, I know you and I have been um, talking at various stages about the upcoming reviews of, of state legislation. So we won't waste the opportunity when um, the you know, BC Act comes up for review to ensure that there is the ability for those types of principles we've raised within this report to be reflected in um, government legislation and then you know rolls downhill to government policy from there. Um, but fundamentally we're we're looking to pursue um, the outcomes around uh, recognition and, and better protections, more sustainable, more permanent protections of, of native vegetation across the state. Yes, and thanks Great, to Peter thank Robertson you. for that question and also for all the work he's done over the years to uh, help protect WA's native edge too. Um, and a follow-up comment um, from Professor Van Leeuwen, um, which was talking about when we we're talking about the land clearing for renewable projects, he's made the point that in the US, um, projects are being pushed forward on brownfield development sites, not greenfield, um, and that could potentially be an option here um, in Western Australia or, you know, a good best practice approach for um, renewable energy sites, particularly um, uh, in, in you know, some parts of the state. Um, I've got time for a couple more questions. So if you have a burning issue, please pop it in the chat, but otherwise I'll continue with the couple I still have here. Um, so have you talked to Deep Herd? Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm laughing because talking to Deep Herd is always quite difficult for, for us. <laughs> um, have you pursued uh, action to have DPIRD stop providing advice to landholders that place land under conservation covenants for 20, 25 years? Um, that were sorry, placed under covenants, you know, 20 to 30 years ago, and that they're now expiring. That now can be cleared. Um, um, so we haven't had a conversation to date. That is a very important issue and we are aware those conservation governments, um, as they expire, it really is opening up um, a lot of options for development of areas we thought were, you know, protected for some time. So those conservation governments are an example of um, a, a good opportunity for what we could be including in, um, in I think, uh, a better system of land restoration and protecting what we've got. Um, it's always been a huge issue. Private land that is high, high, high biodiversity conservation, um, we need to be able to protect it in mechanisms that last longer than the cycles of a 25-year uh, lease or a 25-year conservation covenant. Um, so we, are, we haven't raised that yet, but we are looking to raise that as part of the suite of reform. Yeah, and it's a, a sort of curly adverse outcome that that often um, winds up in the offset space as well, where the, the approved offset might be um, a relatively non-permanent time period, like 25 to 30 years, and then, um, then rip down again um, uh, within, you know, within a generation or a human generation. Um, no, we haven't, we haven't sort of specifically chased after the department on, on that basis um, as yet, but certainly welcome that, um, that consideration if there's specific examples um, or any down the road from the EDO as well. So um, they'd, be, they'd be happy to speak to you, I'm sure. They are aware of the it's one of It's also one of the very few benefits of being housed in the City West Lottery's house is that we can all be quite close to each other when we uh, need to talk about things like this. Um, I think I've got a final question for you, which is probably a nice one to end on, which is, um, do you have short talking points or guides um, and other related materials about the report and your research that people can use to take with them to talk to their communities um, and make contact with their local MPs? We certainly do. And we can um, send that all through. I, I imagine there's a sort of follow-up email from, from this evening along with the recording. Um, but yes, there's, to break it down to a very granular level, there's um, some information on our, um, our website. There's a specific web page dedicated to this report. Um, and there's also um, a couple of briefing notes and, and summary um, one pages that, uh, that encapsulate those recommendations. Um, and, and on that note, that that approach to MPs and any decision makers, we, we would encourage you to 
disseminate that material and, and this type of um, discussion recommendations we've discussed tonight uh, with with your local communities and and any of those representatives um, that that you feel you know need to be updated. Um, again, our movement for life teams. Um, ably assisted by our community organiser Steffi Polly, who's on the on the call tonight. Um, they've been engaging with um, a variety of of upper and lower house MPs um, within WA, um, effectively to remind them that this policy is still as yet unfulfilled and and incomplete. Uh, and in the meantime, you know we haven't been wasting any time um, putting together some some detailed recommendations and some really solid thought and research that um, hopefully bolsters native vegetation policy in WA going forward. Fabulous, thank you. And we'll definitely share um, those links with everybody uh, who has come tonight. Um, that looks like the end of questions. So I really wanted to thank Pat and Janita for agreeing to um, you know, co-host this event with us. Um, it's really nice to have an Environment Matters event which talks back about things that the Conservation Council has its roots in um, and uh, native vegetation and uh, protection of those sorts of things is something that's really nice for us to all be gathered to talk about. Um, I wanted to thank you all for coming and for sort of tolerating our in the office, not in the office, online, not online, um, it's moving around. So thank you very much for that. I just wanted to flag um, two events that are coming up, which might be of interest to you. The next Environment Matters event is a really special one. Um, and it's going to be an update on the CCWA nuclear free campaign, um, which is many of you would know has been running for a really substantial amount of time. Um, and there are a few key moments coming up um, that I think you'll all be really interested in. So that event is going to be held on Wednesday, the 18th of August, and it will be streamed online, but we're also looking to hold it um, at the Perth Library, the State Library um, in the city. And so you'll all get information about that um, quite soon, but that should be a really fabulous and very important event. Um, I also just wanted to flag CCWA's annual conference will be held on the 24th of September this year. Um, and this year we're having a major focus on things just like tonight um, and looking at as how a movement we can work together to convince government, but also industry um, to get on board with the particular initiatives that we're trying to push. Um, so I would encourage you all to keep an eye out for that. Um, it's going to be a really fabulous event and um, we're really looking forward to being able to work with you and particularly our member groups and other organisations in the sector to deliver that. Um, and I can see Steph, my colleagues posted um, those details in the chat. Um, so yeah, I'd like, I'm sure, I mean, we can all clap Pat, Pat and Gina, it's a bit hard on Zoom, but I'm sure you'll join me in saying thank you very much for coming. Um, and hopefully we will see you in person at an event really soon. Um, so thank you so much for coming. Thanks everyone, great to see your faces.